Allow your awareness to settle in on the breath and get aligned with the body. It takes a little experimenting to find exactly what amount of pressure is needed, what amount of force is needed to stay with the breath and the body in a way that's just right. If it's too light, the mind just goes drifting off. If it's too heavy, the body starts feeling constricted, the mind starts feeling constricted, and it's going to look to find a way to get out. So try to see just what amount of awareness is needed, what amount of mindfulness and alertness is needed just to keep the body and the mind together right at the breath. And the breath will be a good barometer to let you know when the pressure is too much, when it's too little. But again, you've got to learn how to read the barometer. This is why we practice meditation day after day after day, to get more familiar with this spot. To begin with, you can focus your awareness at any one spot in the body where the sensation of breathing is very clear. It might be the tip of the nose, the throat, the middle of the chest, the abdomen, any spot where you know clearly now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And there's a sense of rightness about the spot. That's an easy spot to maintain your focus. It may seem strange, this emphasis on ease and comfort in the meditation. After all, we've heard so much about the Buddhist teachings on pain, stress, and suffering. But you have to look carefully about what he has to say about pain, stress, and suffering, and also what he has to say about pleasure. Look at the Four Noble Truths. Number one, of course, is stress and suffering. But buried down in number four, the path the most important factor of the path, which is right concentration. Right there, you try to get the mind focused in on the breath with a sense of ease and rapture that comes from seclusion. Seclusion here meaning that you're not thinking about past, not thinking about the future. You're right here with the present moment. Things are settling in, and there's a kind of snugness to how things feel. feels good being right here. And then you look at what the Buddha has to say about the the tasks for each of those, each of the noble truths. The task with regard, regard to suffering and stress is to comprehend it. The task with regard to the path is to develop it, which means you want to develop that sense of ease, that sense of rapture that comes as the mind begins to settle down into concentration. In other words, what you're doing, you're taking one of the aggregates, the aggregate of feeling, and instead of latching onto it or pushing it away, you learn how to use it as a tool. In other words, when pain and stress and suffering comes, okay, you want to comprehend it. Because through comprehending pain and stress, you learn a lot about the mind. The Buddha never said that life is suffering. He just said there is suffering in life, which are two very different teachings. As long as there's going to be pain, as long as there's going to be suffering, just get the most use out of it. Because you find as you focus on pain, get to know it, get to comprehend it. You learn all kinds of things about how the mind is working. In particular, you learn to see what it's doing to take that pain and turn it into mental pain. Or if you've already got mental pain, make it worse. But in order to be able to watch that feeling of pain, long enough and consistently enough so you can really comprehend it. The mind needs strength, it needs nourishment, otherwise it just gets drained, worn out. And that's where the element of pleasure in the path comes in. That's your nourishment. Trying to create a sense of well-being in the mind as it's focused in the present moment. So it doesn't feel threatened by the pain, doesn't feel drained by the pain. So you know that you always have a place to go when you need that strength. So what we're doing is taking one of the aggregates that we usually cling to, 
And clinging here doesn't mean only just holding on to it, but also the way you try to push it away. And pushing away, it's kind of like trying to push a tar baby away. The more you push it away, the more you get stuck. So instead of clinging or pushing away, we try to learn how to use these things as tools. This is one of the common themes that runs throughout all the Buddhist teachings, that before you can let go of anything, you have to learn how to master it. Because otherwise you're just holding on, pulling, pushing away, holding on, pushing away. And nothing comes of that except more stress, more suffering, more pain. And it harms not only you, but the people around you. If you're constantly feeling worn down by your the pains and the inconveniences of life, it's going to be harder and harder to be kind to other people. In fact, most of the evil things I've seen people do in their lives come through a sense of being just totally overwhelmed, feeling weak and trapped, and they lash out. But if you give the mind this sense of strength that comes from knowing that it has its center that it can return to and gain nourishment, okay, it's a gift not only to yourself but to the people around you. It's not a selfish practice. So as long as you learn how not to hold on to feelings as being yourself, grabbing hold of the pleasant ones, pushing the painful ones away, learn how to use them as tools. And as tools they begin to open things up in the mind. You understand where the mind is unskillful in its thinking, unskillful in how it manages its thinking. And you realize you don't have to be unskillful. There are better ways to think, better ways to manage the, mo the thought processes in the mind. And the funny thing happens, as you begin to master these things, you, they bring you to a point where everything just reaches equilibrium. And that's where you can really let go. At the point you even let go of your tools at that point, because they've taken you where you want to go. From that point in, okay, it all opens up on the deathless. But to get there, you can't push and pull your way around. If it was something you could force your way into, everybody would have gone to Nirvana a long time ago. It requires a lot of finesse. A lot of skill in how you deal with the mind. Learning when the time is to focus on issues of stress and suffering in the mind, and when the time comes to focus on just letting the mind rest. So it can gain strength and go back. And now, really, the ultimate skill is learning how to put those two things together. In other words, you develop states of concentration to give the mind a really solid center. And from that center, can begin to let go of things that are obviously unskillful, obviously things you don't want to hang on to. And then, when you've let go of everything else, then you turn on that pleasant center that you've been developing. And that's when you begin to take that apart. But all too often we've, we've read the books and they say, well, try to get onto an insight as fast as possible. And we can tend to destroy the various, you know, the very quality that's going to help us. This ability to get the mind aligned with the body in a way that feels just right. And to use the strength and use the nourishment that comes from that, the stillness and ease the steadiness that can come from that, then you can really gain insight. In other words, you can't just push concentration away or go rushing through the various levels. It's something you want to settle down into. So you can stay still, calm, for long periods of time. And when you can stay that way and during your formal sitting, you can take that out and try to maintain that same calm center no matter what happens. And that's when you really gain interesting insights into the mind, see how it goes flowing out after things. Rushing to grab hold of this, rushing to push that away. When the Buddha talks about effluence in the mind, things flowing out of the mind, you actually get a physical sense of an energy flowing out as the mind loses its center, loses its alignment with the body and goes out someplace else. 
And the trick is learning how to maintain that still, steady observer. So you can see the movement and realize that you don't have to go along with the movement. The movement is something separate. The knower is something separate. And when you have that clearly delineated, okay, then you can begin to really see what the mind does. It's skillful and unskillful. You begin to see cause and effect. in a way that really opens things up in the mind. So we carry these five khandhas around with us, these aggregates. And then the wisdom of the Buddha is taking these aggregates that tend to weigh us down. They're just like big lumps of metal in a, in a suitcase. We'll open up the suitcase and look inside, and you begin to see, well, it's not just lumps of metal. There are potential tools there that you can apply to various things so that you don't have to lug things around anymore. You use them to cut away your obvious attachments, and then finally when everything else is taken care of, okay, then you let go of your attachments here to the tools themselves. But until that point, you want to take good care of them. And it's not to the point of worshiping the tools, but careful enough so that the, the tools stay in good shape, you can actually use them. This is why the Buddha didn't teach self-torment. But he didn't teach indulgence either. The right, the middle path between the two is not sort of a half indulgence and half torment, but it's learning how to regard these aggregates. You've got an aggregate of feeling, like we've talked about tonight, perception, thought constructs, consciousness, form, which is the body. Learning how to treat them as tools, showing them the proper care and attention that tools need, but also realizing you don't want to get attached to them or grab hold of them. They've got their uses. They're not ends in and of themselves. Once you've got that point clear, then the path really opens up.